Hi, welcome to this e-lecture on category sourcing strategies. My name is Finn Winstra, and I'm a professor of purchasing and supply management at Rotterdam School of Management, Erasmus University. In this part one of uh, this e-lecture, I will talk about the fundamentals of category sourcing. And category sourcing basically is the process by which firms and other organizations develop and implement their strategies for particular groups of services and products that they buy. There's also part two to this presentation, which you can watch after this first part or can be uh, watched uh, independently. I will give you some more uh, of the items of the agenda of that second lecture at the end of this session. In this session, I will address the following topics. First of all, I will talk about what is a category sourcing strategy and what is its meaning or relevance in the overall purchasing process. Secondly, I will talk you through the elements of a category sourcing strategy. What do you actually take decisions on when you develop a category sourcing strategy? Thirdly, I'll take you to a couple of models, how to determine the scope of a sourcing category, okay? Uh, I'll talk you through the situation where you wanna have more detailed sourcing uh, categories, more narrowly defined ones, or more broadly defined ones. Then I'll come to kind of the meat, the, the, the core of category sourcing strategies, and that is where I will talk about four ideal types of categories and category strategies. And I'll specifically refer to a very popular and commonly used model, the so-called cottage purchasing portfolio. And subsequently, I'll talk you through uh, the operationalization of the axes of this portfolio, because I think that is one very important aspect uh, in setting up these strategies, which sometimes tends to be overlooked. Now, first of all, let me give you one or two def definitions on category sourcing strategies. Here you can see that the category strategy defines the sourcing objectives and the way a company or any organization will select and interact with the given supply base for that particular category to achieve certain outcomes, whether it's related to innovation, cost savings, quality, et cetera. And in essence, it is a continuous process where it's not just the purchasing department, but also other functions such as marketing, R&D, production, collaborate, to continuously identify and implement uh, improvement actions, if you like. To place it into context, it's helpful to look at the model such as this one by IBM, uh, which is a popular reference model, a so-called purchasing process model, which identifies at the upper half, the so-called sourcing cycle, and at the bottom half of the circle, the so-called purchase to pay processes. And in the upper half, you see a total of five core, more strategic processes, if you like, um, one of which is sourcing strategies. And that's exactly the topic of this lecture. Now, if you take a closer look on how uh, category sourcing is actually placed in the overall purchasing process in the different types of strategic decisions that uh, purchasing managers and, and related functions need to make. You could see it as a sort of a strategic alignment, a cascading process. And it starts at the upper left with business goals, which should inform the performance objectives for the purchasing function as a whole. For instance, in certain firms, the emphasis for the purchasing function should perhaps be more on innovation, whereas other functions in other organizations are perhaps predominantly focused towards cost savings. Now that should be typically broken down to or specified into objectives per sorts and category. So we as a university, for instance, we buy IT, equipment, we buy software, we buy paper, we buy toilet paper. Uh, 
for each of these different categories, we probably need to define different objectives, okay? Having defined those objectives, we can develop so-called category sourcing strategies, which then should inform our supplier selection criteria and subsequently contract performance terms and supplier performance criteria. So you can see that category sourcing strategies are a fundamental step or hinge in this process going from business goals to supplier performance criteria and obviously supplier performance in the very end. Now, if you look at the uh, uh, category sourcing strategies, there's different templates, different organizations use them in more or less detailed ways. But the typical kind of structure of a category sourcing strategy is formed by the so-called six buckets approach. And I'll briefly take you through the different buckets. It starts actually with defining what kind of products, be it services or physical goods that we want to buy. Okay. What is the design? What are the type of specifications? Do we want to use a certain standards available in the supplier market? Second aspect is supply-based structuring. This is more the outcome of the decision-making process for the strategy. How many suppliers do we want to have for this category? What type of suppliers do we want? Large firms, small firms, firms that invest a lot in R&D or that are more lean and mean. The sourcing bucket looks at how much we want to buy or we need to or anticipate to buy of a certain product or service. We want to define perhaps how, how we're going to allocate the volumes across multiple suppliers if we've decided to work with multiple suppliers. And we're also going to set some objectives around, for instance, the influence of suppliers on the specifications of the products and services and the early or late involvement in innovation or development. On the upper right hand, you see the fourth bucket contracting. So then we are entering the decisions as to how our contracts will look like. Will we have one contract for our entire organization? Uh, or do we want to say, well, we're using multiple suppliers and these suppliers are typically only active in one or two countries where we operate. So it's better to have local contracts. We also want to say something about the type of conditions. Do we want to, for instance, in, uh, implement certain uh, penalties and incentives for performance? A typical fifth, fifth bucket uh, revolves around supplier development. So what are the kind of best-in-class targets that we want to set? And how are we going to help suppliers meet those targets? Do we want to establish, for instance, supplier councils that help us think through improvements in our sourcing process and how we can better assist the suppliers. And maybe we wanna do supplier surveys, satisfaction surveys to see where we can kind of improve our processes. And finally, we get to the more logistics oriented buckets, so-called supply chain consideration. And what's our forecasting plans or methods in this case uh, who will be uh, responsible for freight duties and tariffs, etc., inventory locations, what have you. Now, just to give you a, a brief illustration of a, of a typical sourcing strategy, how it looks like, it can be very complex or detailed, I should say, involving a document of uh, 10, 15 pages, but it could also be very simply a one pager, okay? which obviously is sufficient for the more smaller routine-like categories, um, but also is quite often effective in communicating, for instance, with senior management. And here you will recognize uh, most of the buckets that I've talked you through on the previous slides. On the left top, you see category definition, and that was the product specifications. You see an analysis of the current demand, what's the volumes that we're buying, we see uh, on the uh, item three, internal demand is, let's say the requirements of the different internal customers, is it the same? Well, here you see that some of uh, the internal customers 
are quality labs and others are research labs okay, for this type of product, okay, laboratory disposable. So that could mean that they have slightly different requirements as to their products. You see a definition or a description of the current uh, suppliers uh, that we're working with, and you see a portfolio positioning here uh, using the so-called Crowdleach model, which I will explain in more detail later on. Under item six, there is a reflection of external trends, sector dynamics, and an analysis of, of the buyer's uh, power and the supplier's uh, power in this market. That is also an element I will come to. And on the top right, uh, you see the actual strategy. So the left is more the facts and analysis, to the right is the strategy and the plan. And the upper half focuses very much on the type of decisions that we've talked through uh, earlier uh, regarding let's say the sourcing decisions. The bottom half right, you see the so-called implementation adaptation plan. That was not part of the six buckets showed earlier, but that's more the, let's say the, the process, how to actually implement this in the organization, how to get to that desired state, if you like. Now, let's, before we go into detailed models, uh, archetypes of what could, uh, are uh, category sourcing strategies. Let's first take a step back and look at what is a category, okay? I've talked about toilet paper, IT, etc. but how do you actually define the categories within a buying organization? Now, fortunately, as a buying organization, you don't, do not need to start from scratch. There are several standard procurement classification systems around, and many ERP systems actually have such a classification system in there. Okay? One of the most widely used ones is the United Nations Standard Products and Services Code, UNSPSC. Okay? And that's what I have derived this illustration from. So typically it, those systems have, or classification systems have four different levels, starting with segments, then families, class, and finally at the most detailed level, category or commodity, okay? So here you see it start with logistics, then you can, within logistics services, you can distinguish distribution, warehousing, and value-added services, such as repacking, et cetera, uh, refurbishment, uh, then within distribution, for instance, we can distinguish different uh, modes of transport, road, air, and sea. And within road, we can distinguish different categories of commodities, uh, full truckload, less than truckload, and parcel deliveries, for instance. Okay. Now, this is just an illustration. When What are the appropriate categories to use within a, each buying organization it is up to the buying organization. For instance, your particular buying organization may not be buying air services, okay? But at least you can find in these existing classifications most uh, of the categories that uh, you would like to distinguish for your organization, okay? Now, the question is obviously how detailed should you go? Maybe for some organizations, it's okay to define a purchasing strategy or sourcing strategy at the level of distribution services or road transportation. But others maybe need to define it at the level of full truckload versus less than truckload, et cetera. So how do we know? Well, I can't give you the precise answer for each and every organization, but there's a couple of rules to take into account. So first of all, you need to define categories at an increasing level of detail when you have a high degree of variety within the category, okay? So for instance, variety in the function that the product or service fulfills because it affects the applicable requirements. So think of, for instance, a dairy company that buys packaging, okay? Say for a yogurt product, okay? Some of these packagings may actually be used for a private label, okay, which they sell to a supermarket. But for other yogurt products, it may be for a uh, A brand, 
Okay. And that means that perhaps the demands that these final customers have on their products, how they show up in their shelves, differ. Okay. The marketing people at the dairy company may also want to use the packaging in a different way. For the private label, it needs to be first and foremost functional. And for the A brand, it needs to um, contribute, for instance, to the brand image. If those differences are large enough, it could actually mean that this dairy company needs to set up a specific category sourcing strategy for packaging for yogurt products, for A labels, uh, and a separate one for private labels. Okay. The other degree of variety can come not from the demand, but from the supply. So the more the supply markets are actually fragmented, for instance, in geographical terms, or in uh, the types of products and services that they offer, the more need you will, you will have uh, to differentiate or specify your strategies. So think of a situation going back to the logistic services from a slide ago, if there's different operators are uh, operating in full truckload than in less than truckload, you probably want to have a specific category sourcing for less than truckload road transportation and full truckload road transportation because there's no suppliers that actually offer both services at the same time. And finally, very simply stated, if you have higher volumes of spend, and this is all relative, obviously, within a given organization, the higher spend you have in a certain category, the more need or the more potential value can be derived from dissecting or disaggregating your category strategy. Now, let's then move to some of the tools that are actually used um, to determine the appropriate category sourcing strategy. And one of the most well-known tools for this is the so-called Kralich matrix or portfolio analysis. And this was actually um, put forward already in 1983 in an article in Harvard Business Review. You'll find the reference at the end of the presentation. And it's actually used by lots of organizations, both in public and private settings. And the basic idea that Kralich put forward here uh, was that you should differentiate your category sourcing strategies based on two factors. First of all, on the horizontal axis, supply risk. And secondly, on the vertical axis, impact on business value. Supply risk consists of a number of dimensions. And it's important to have a look at these six uh, different uh, dimensions uh, because Kralich actually had a very nuanced idea of how supply risk is built up. It's, for instance, not just reflected in the number of potential suppliers available in the market, but also by the capacity in the market. Okay, Is it a, a buyer's market or is it the supplier's market? Are there entry barriers? For instance, in the Netherlands, we have the National Railroad System Operator ProRail that only has five parties that can do regular maintenance on the railroad track. So there are a number of potential suppliers available, but the entry barriers uh, for uh, accreditation purposes, these suppliers need to meet, uh, need to meet safety requirements, etc. The entry barriers are pretty high. Okay. even if there's many suppliers, for instance, outside of the Netherlands available. But also, if there are uh, no entry barriers, if there is a large number of uh, suppliers in the pool available, you may still have switching costs or time to take that needs to, um, uh, it requires time to actually be able to switch from one supplier to the other. For instance, because of administrative uh, adjustments or because your machines need to uh, be adjusted, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these six factors actually contribute to supply risk. 
On the vertical axis, there's impact on business value. Now, most organizations actually measure this in the form of spend, okay? And I think this is a fundamental misinterpretation or oversimplification of the model that Kralich put forward because he explicitly lists it as just one of the criteria. But you see that the other criteria are not so much monetary. So for instance, the impact on overall strategy, for instance, if my organization has a strategy to really be um, environmentally responsible, um, some of my categories on the buy side may play a very important role in actually achieving optimal environmental impact, okay? Regardless of what the costs actually are involved. So particularly when purchasing wants to use this as a tool to also align the rest of the organization, and, and it should, as we've seen in the definitions, it is important that the impact on business value, uh, if you're using this segmentation, uh, acknowledges other dimensions than just spend. Okay. Now, having measured a given category, for instance, less than truckload uh, transportation services, on these different dimensions, you can plot it into this uh, XY space, and, and then you will find it sitting in one of those four quadrants. Quadrants, which, by the way, are ideal types. Okay. And the first ideal type, if you like, the first strategy or type of categories is the so-called strategic categories. High supply risk, high impact. Okay. At the other extreme, low impact, low risk, routine items. Okay. And then the off diagonals, if you like, upper left leverage, lots of impact, but little risk, and the bottom right, high risk, but little impact, okay? I'll, I'll go and discuss the different strategies in a minute, but let me first point out that Kralitz also made the observation that making this segmentation is very important in order to avoid that buyers are spending their time on relatively unimportant categories. So the basic notion which we repeatedly get confirmed in when we study different organizations is that about 80, 90% of, of a firm's spend is typically in the upper half. It obviously depends on how you define, let's say the mid uh, point on the vertical axis, but usually 80, 90% of uh, uh, a, an organization spend and uh, ends up as leverage or strategic, okay? Now, on the other hand, that repre represents only about 10 to 20% of the orders and the number of suppliers, okay? So the corollary is that about 10, 20% of your spend is in the bottom half, but it represents 80, 90% of the number of suppliers and the number of SKU, stock keeping units, or the number of orders, okay? So if you allocate your time based on the number of suppliers and the number of orders, you spend a lot of time on those categories that do not have the most important impact on business value. Okay. So that is one key thing that, that Kralitz also tried to bring across uh, through this segmentation method. Now, if you go to then the four different quadrants, you can distinguish four ideal types of different strategies. In the upper right hand quarter, you see performance-based partnership. This is the kind of suppliers or categories where you want to work with suppliers to innovate, okay? Here you want to improve the quality of the products and services that you're buying, etc. Here is where you will typically use one, maybe two suppliers, okay? In the upper left-hand quadrant, you have much less supply risk, but still it's very important. So you still want to spend time on it, but you can play off different suppliers against each other, either in negotiation tra uh, trajectories or even during uh, the contract. So you could have multiple suppliers 
to have them keep each other on their toes, um, uh, to have price and cost transparency, et cetera. In the bottom right, you have bottleneck products. This is where you are facing, for instance, monopolistic uh, uh, suppliers, uh, large entry barriers, et cetera, okay? The problem is that uh, the, the risk is very high, but you cannot afford to pay too much time to this, okay? So what you wanna do is in an effective way, try and secure supply, maybe search for alternatives, so modify the specs, go and find suppliers in totally new regions, etc cetera, etc cetera. and finally on the bottom left you have routine products now one and and i think this speaks for themselves you have a large product variety you want to focus uh, uh, on uh, getting the products in at a, a efficient uh, in an efficient way here by the way companies are also often applying single sourcing for very different reasons than in the upper right quadrant there it is in strategic products and services. It is for quality and innovation purposes. Here it is to simplify the administrative and logistics uh, first and foremost. If you're not careful, you spend more money and time on actually the process of buying this stuff than it, the products and services themselves are actually worth. So that's the four main category sourcing strategies that Kralitz defines. Now, coming back to my earlier point about uh, the vertical axis, it, I, I want to stress again that given that the category sourcing strategy is really meant to align the actions of different functions, the, the basis for the segmentation of the categories really needs to be supported by different stakeholders. So it's fine if you use a slightly different method than, than what I've just suggested. Uh, I will show other models uh, as well, uh, particularly in the, um, in the subsequent advanced presentation. But regardless of the AXEC model, I think it's very important that the different functions are aligned, okay? Only in that way can purchasing as a whole contribute to realizing the objectives of the buying organization. So if you don't do that, many traditional purchasing departments have the tendency to simplify the vertical access to purchase spend, okay? And that I think has significant negative consequences, okay? You're, the, the one thing is that, that the category sourcing strategies may not be appropriate from the corporate strategy point of view. Uh, and in doing so, the other functions may not agree on the segmentation. And finally, suppliers are kind of driven into a corner where sort of spend or cost savings is the only sort of um, value creation dimension that you can work on together, okay? Now, finally, I want to close off with one caveat is that next to category segmentation methods, we also have supplier segmentation methods. And there's actually two methods or ways that buying organizations segment their suppliers. First of all, they do it within a category, okay? So if they do that, and here's an illustration from Columbia University, uh, using terms like strategic preferred uh, department select agreement, etc. When they do that within a category, it mainly pertains to the preferential status that suppliers may or may not have. Okay, so can, going back to the example of the laboratory equipment a few slides ago, if you've read it carefully. Uh, you can see actually that there's a couple of suppliers that were selected for a global preferred vendor status and others that were more, let's say, optional uh, suppliers that could be used in any given country on a local basis, okay? So more of a tactical supplier, if you like, okay? And those, let's say, status could be dependent on their delivery performance in the past, uh, quality, or their pricing levels, for instance, okay? 
And you typically want to do that if you have multiple suppliers and if you have high volumes and multi-unit buying organizations, okay, with different plans, different businesses, et cetera, okay? Then such further segmentation within the category makes sense. Now watch out the other level at which we can have supply segmentation is also the supra category segmentation. So across categories. And this is a situation where say an automotive, a automotive uh, assembly firm buys different components from one and the same supplier, such as for instance, a Robert Bosch. Okay, it may buy different types of electronics, ignition systems, et cetera, et cetera. So it may have different category buyers allocated to Robert Bosch to deal with the different products. Um, but on top of that, it may want to also try and harmonize some of, or coordinate at least, some of the approaches towards the supplier as a whole, okay? And that's where you get the term strategic suppliers, leverage suppliers, etc. okay? So that is typically across the category. Now, again, both type of supplier segmentations may be used by an organization. One of them might be used or none of them may be used, but it is essentially something different than the category segmentation. So in sum, I've talked you through what is a category sourcing strategy. I've talked about the different dimensions. We've talked about single versus multiple sourcing, contract duration, the involvement of suppliers in specification setting. We've talked about how to determine the scope of a category. We've looked at four ideal types and there are other models around and I will show one of them in the subsequent presentation. Uh, and we've talked about this very important issue of the personalization of the axis of the portfolio in the case of crowdits, but more broadly, if you use any segmentation method, the criteria uh, are very important and particularly to do that in a cross-functional setting. Now in the subsequent ad advanced session, I will talk about looking at the supplier's perspective, okay? Because we've now looked at suppliers from the buying firm's perspective, but how do suppliers actually segment their buyers and should that affect our purchasing strategies? And finally, I'll talk about the appropriate portfolio distribution. We've talked about the vertical distribution, but is there an idea of what is ideal or recommended in terms of the horizontal distribution of your spend across the portfolio? in the case of the Crowley's portfolio. So I'll come to that in, uh, in the second presentation. And here's a couple of references and uh, some further reading. The basic textbook by Arian van Weyle uh, has a particular chapter on category sourcing strategies as well. So thank you.